trust me, I won't be at all offended if anyone moves and leaves in the middle. I'm kind of used to it. So, uh, but in terms of, you know, just having a conversation, which is the whole thing, idea of this, it would be good if I could also hear you as well. So, so come in. Hi, Pam. Gail, come in. <laughs> yeah, you want to escape early. Okay, I get it. <laughs> That's great. What's that timing? So guys, have you all got some kind of lunch? Or have you, are you all foregoing lunch to be here? No, oh, oh my God, the pressure. <laughs> I was thinking you're going to bring your lunch in and you're just going to relax. And actually, the theme I've got may not be as appropriate if you're all sitting there hungry. <laughs> never mind, never mind. Yes, yes. Yes. You kind of look at it and you think, oh, I really want that biscuit, but I ought to be seen to be picking up the apple. <laughs> and that is the theme of today's lunchtime session, actually. <laughs> oh, they're shutting the doors. Shutting the doors. But I'm just thrilled that you're actually interested enough in the research um, about what's going on and what it means to you. I really would like to have a conversation today rather than a preach, if that makes sense. So I want to give you some resources. I've been pulling together a whole range of different research reports that I've drawn on regularly over the years. So I've pulled that together in a little padlet for you guys. So, you know. Do feel free, if you do need to leave before the end of the session, zero problem with that at all, because I just really appreciate the fact that you're all giving up your time at lunchtime. So I want to give you something valuable. Um, I've just come up from downstairs. Um, I've been coming along to the Learning Technology Show for the 23 years that it's been running. And I've been working in EdTech for a good 10 years before that, so I'm kind of feeling a little bit old um, at the moment. But 20 years ago, um, there was such a flurry of new things happening in education technology. And there were so many kind of aspirations. It's going to change the world. We're going to change the world. It's going to take our jobs. No, it's not. E-learning, classroom learning, blended learning. You know, there was a whole buzz and the hype 20 years ago. And actually, a lot of people were failing. 60% of e-learning projects 20 years ago were, were fall, falling down. I found out since then that actually 60% failure on an innovative new idea is actually really strong and really healthy. Um, but I was super interested in the 40% who seemed to be getting something right. And that started my kind of research journey. So I'm celebrating 20 years looking at learning technology and education and impact research. And for the first 15 years of that 20 years, I used to come here and launch the new findings every single year. So it's really interesting for me, research for me, um, forgive me, as a, as, as a woman working in the ed tech field, I struggled to get my voice heard. I struggled to hear my own voice. <laughs> And I found that research was really important for me as a personal development process of understanding and having the confidence to stand up and say, actually, I need to challenge what's going on here. So personally, research for me has been a friend in my career, and it's been a help to me. So I wanted us to use this session today. I can share with you all kinds of different reports, but I want you to kind of maybe renew your relationship with research and what it needs to mean to you here. Does that, does that sound okay? Please feel free to leave now if you want to. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I want to look at research from the perspective of, is it a superfood or is it a killer carb? You know, we're encouraged here at Learning Technologies and as chairs, we're encouraged if anyone puts up a statistic, they have to put up a source because we believe that everyone now is going to want to look at the source in order to make sure that the person on the stage isn't lying. 
like we've got time to do that, but at least the essence of that is the right thing. You know, what, what is our kind of heart of where we're coming from with research? So, you know, a, a statistic that 60% six, of e-learning projects fail, I knew at the time, I had half of my audience going, yes, I told you. I told you that it wasn't going to work. And the other half going, oh, well, maybe, you know, I just invested all this money, you know, it's, uh, you know they're setting themselves up for failure. So our response to statistics, any statistic, can actually mean that it's a superfood for us if we agree with what we're seeing, like we heard this morning, or if we don't. So I kind of want us to have that kind of theme in mind at the moment. So um, I'd love to know what kind of research resources you draw on as, a learning, as learning professionals. We're quite a small group. Would you mind sharing just verbally some of the studies that you may or may not look at? Or if you don't look at research at all, that is super cool. I'd love to know that if you don't use research at all. So, you know, please uh, kind of share with me some of the things that you like to look at and that you look forward to, to seeing or have been useful for you. Anybody? Pam? Um, so I like to look at Harvard Business Review. The Harvard Business Review resources. Fantastic articles on research that they've done. Yeah. And I find it very engaging in the way that they've done it. Yeah. So Harvard Business Review is a nice kind of synopsis of what else is going on, what else is going on, and you can dig deeper into the research behind that. So it's kind of very digestible, isn't it? Yeah. So always looking on the, on the lookout for research that links coaching and performance. And so I guess what you're saying there is actually research that allows you to develop your practice and maybe challenge your own professional thinking as well in coaching for this one, yeah? Also for more of the why. Um, yeah. So when you're trying to convince an organisation or a stakeholder that something's important, yeah. it's the evidence that supports that yeah. of why they should be investing both from a, a time point of view and a financial point of view. Yeah. So really looking for credible references that yeah. would um, really add weight to that yeah. argument. So it's kind of that ev building that evidence base for you to have, like I found, be able to have a different type of conversation with your stakeholders when you've got more supported evidence around you. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else actually look at any research in their own practice or have heard of any? There's a couple of Anka, and then there's a gentleman at the back, and then just over here as well, Anka. Yeah, so one, one piece of research that I'm doing right now is investigating what are the human meta skills that we need to dial up uh, to really support ourselves in the workplace during this AI revolution. Mm. Uh, and I'm doing that by uh, really reading a lot and investigating in trusted sources, but at the same time doing a lot of interviews with people inside my organization and then outside as well. So you're actually using almost like a literature review, what's already going on out there and then how does that weigh up in my own organisation through interviews and things like that. Yes. Looking at the kind of meta skills type mm. areas there. Brilliant, thank you. There was a gentleman just at the back there and then this gentleman here as well. Well, I would say we are probably usually using the usual suspects. So it's Josh Burson, um, LinkedIn Learning or LinkedIn in general, consulting firms, McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, yeah. Corporate Research Forum. So, yeah, yeah, curious to hear what you think about them. Yeah, uh, all on my list, all on my list. One or two, I'm thinking, oh, I didn't put that one on. So when you get my list, you can add your own, your own on because it's, it's the ones that are go-to ones which are important, which so I wanted to know what your go-to ones are as well. I love the McKinsey's and things like that, mainly because they are the sorts of things that our business leaders are also likely to be reading. So that is super, super helpful for us. So um, Julian, we're just saying what research resources that we uh, all use, and so I'm gonna come to you in a moment, but then this gentleman here, <laughs> just no pressure, but hey. <laughs> so the, the work I'm involved in is supporting the growth of digital and technology within policing. So looking at working with the likes of the College of Policing and with police forces to understand how digital skills are being embedded into everyday 
uh, investigations and activity. So it's working with, I suppose, our customers very closely to understand where they're embracing digital technology yeah. and where they're not, and obviously using that through a learning uh, yeah. platforms. Yes, yeah, brilliant. So that's kind of like more sector-specific insights, but actually on a much broader um, issue of digital skills and the skills that we need. So there's kind of, I guess there's two sources of, of research that kind of inspires the work that you're doing as well. Thank you so much for that. Sorry. <laughs> Julian, um, briefly, what kind of research do you draw, draw on? Because I know that you kind of dig in. I, I ran to get here, so I'm really out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Trying not to gasp while answering that. Um, I think I like to triangulate between qualitative and quantitative uh, and experiential stuff. I think it's very easy to um, believe there's less value in qualitative research and even to find opportunities to do your own you know, direct um, qualitative research. Just asking people is, is a, a really useful thing to do. Yeah. It might not be true by a universal standard of truth, but it's typically true for what people yeah. do and operate in every day. Yeah. Um, I often think about set sense making when it comes to research. So research itself rarely gives you an answer. The data doesn't give you an answer. The sense making does. So really carefully looking at that in your organization. Where is your sense making structure? And do you tend to drive towards consensus or can you tolerate difference? That can be really valuable mm -hmm. in a research context. Yeah, I, I was um, having a debate with Donald Clark about Maslow in for some of the learning science work we're doing. And somebody said to me yesterday, oh, I saw you were having an argument. And, and Donald and I looked at each other, and uh, I don't know if he's here. We're like, we weren't having an argument. <laughs> it's like I rewrote the work because of that feedback. Yeah. And that's a hard mindset to get. I yeah. think you have to invest in each other to get to that level of trust, but it yeah. makes you work better. Thank you so much. On that note, how many people were actually at the event, uh, the keynote this morning? Because when I was watching um, Bo Lotto this morning, my heart was like going really fast. I was like, my goodness, this, what he's saying is so important for this session right now. And it's what we bring and the lens that we bring to the research that we see that is as important as the research resources that we access. So, you know, I'm going to put a QR code up now, and just to let you know, that, that basically will go into my email for an out of office, and it will ping you straight back a Padlet with all kinds of different resources on, which I will update after this session with your recommendations as well. But I'm also going to have it at the end of the event. But if you're not here at the end of this session, and you're planning to walk out to go and get some lunch, I thought I'd put it up for you now. But this kind of sense of how we interact with the studies around us is super important. You know, whether it's the Harvard Business Review or whether it's the kind of coaching aspects that we've got is a really critical element. And I will come back and share with this, this QR code to you at the end. So um, because it was lunchtime and because I also thought you would all have food rather than me making you hungry by showing you food, um, I thought I'd kind of go along this kind of food theory because any piece of research can actually be a kind of superfood for you or a killer carb. It can be good for you or bad for you. And it was because of what Bo was talking about this morning it's the layer of interpretation that we put onto that piece of research. And if we're kind of quite negative and we see something and it proves that we're negative, it can really sap our energy and take away that curiosity that Bo was talking about this morning, that sense of growth and adaptability. You know, as Julian was just sharing just then, you know, actually another piece of research, even if it's counter to what you fundamentally believe, Digging in, stretching, can grow those neurons that we have within our brain to allow us to be more flexible. So what I want to say to you today is actually any food, any piece of research can have any number of kind of uses for you. So there isn't a good or a bad piece. It's the way that we position it, the way that we interpret it, the way we use it. And so for me, I kind of uh, looked at the kind of research that we do have as a a quick snack. You know, what's that? Oh, that quick thing that you can pop up there and it's just what I need to make my business case. 
you know, AI is going to change the world. I'm going to just going to use that, slot that in as to why I need more learning and development budget. You know, so it's kind of it can be helpful, um, but it's that kind of quick snack. It's satisfying that on the go. You know, sort of like literally. You know what? This is making me feel good. It's giving me just that boost that I need right now. I knew I was right. The study said. You know, but many other people may not necessarily agree with that. It could be research that we use to build our argument, build our own skill, build, fuel our professional practice. And that's more than just one study or one stat or one Instagram account. It, we, know we need to start to build up a diet that's good for us. And that personal healthy option diet is really important because it's unique to us. So how we use research is really important, our context and our personal context and what's important to us is, is really critical. It could be that we're kind of like, oh, I just want a little taste of that and a taste of that and a taste of that. And actually, sometimes that's good for expanding our minds. It's just good for helping us think differently. So if you see a study out there and you think, oh, you know, I feel like I want to argue with that, but I'm just going to dig in there a little bit more, um, you know, for us to be open to that. And some research is just a kind of a treat, a really good treat. So, oh, yes, I knew that. It, 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 all those happiness things that they were talking about this morning, I agree with that. I, I knew I was right, and it was a good treat. But actually, if we shared it with other people just in that context, it probably might not be a treat for them in the way that they use their studies. So, you know, when we're looking at some research, um, which I'm going to share with you some stuff, I want you to... Be aware that all of these options are okay, but if you only eat this or you only eat the treats, it probably isn't going to do you that much good. Um, so it's about getting this balanced diet and being aware of how we're using research in our own practice, I think, is really important. So I guess I'd love us to have a conversation in the room with each other about what is the sensible choice for you. And what I mean by that is, why is it that you have come to this session? What do you want to be able to do? We've talked about personal growth. We've talked about independent projects in the police and anchor with your work. You know, we've all got a reason why we want to get a little bit of a diet of research into our own practices. So it would be great if we can just chat for two, three minutes with a pair and say, why? Why, why, do we, why are we interested in research? What's, what's good for you right now? What are you looking for? Um, if you don't talk to each other, there's probably we won't be able to help you. So um, please talk to each other now. So it would be great to get maybe a little bit of feedback about what you want your research diet to do for you. Uh, so it, would anyone like to perhaps share just briefly a couple of things from, we've already had a few examples, but Stella, thank you. <laughs> So you're saying about it's not just what the research says, but what does the what are the arguments against what the research says? And you, you use research, you but you use research in your work. So why do you use research in your work, Stella? Sorry, just pick up yes. Because it helps to validate what your good research helps to validate what you're doing and I think that's really important and it adds to your credibility you know if you're talking to senior people and you say but the research says this then I think they believe in it more so it's around validation and credibility and making sure you're doing the right thing not the wrong yeah. thing you can spend a lot of time and money wasting time on stuff that really doesn't work and if you actually check out the research and see well what are other people doing that really works then I think that's that's really important and you use research in learning design don't you really learning into design making and, yeah, sure think, thinking about learning yeah. in, in any way yeah. yeah yeah perfect thank you so much for that um, who else has got, maybe in this chunk here, because I just want to be kind to our microphone, you know, uh, how, how do you, what do you want research to do for you? Because your diet, your requirements are going to be different 
to sellers. So anyone else in this area here? Thank you at the front here. I don't come from a learning and development background, so this is all right. new to me. But I would like, aside from having basis to substantiate what, what I'm putting out there, is also identify future trends. Mm -hmm. So on, when I'm thinking this morning and the biases and the evidence we've got, you know, not to kind of just use the assumptions, but obviously we've got to have them, but, you know, identify the future trends. Are we doing the right thing? Yeah. What are the others doing? I want to know how I'm positioning myself ag um, against other business, yeah? yeah. So uh, we're competing for skills of people all the time. So I want to know what's out there. Yeah. So this kind of, it's our own practice that we want to improve and make sure we're making good decisions, but also this sense of what's coming. And yesterday's keynote, are we ready for it? How do we use that knowledge to be ready and be willing to adapt for the future as well. So research is so critical to kind of give us that sense. Research from the past and also that that's the research that's predicting the future as well. So thank you for that. Any other thoughts in this, in this area here before we move the microphone over here? No? What, what about over in this, in this corner now? What, why are you using, why are you interested in a diet of research in your professional lives? Thank you. Okay, we focused uh, our conversation actually about what we're using research for yeah. um, yes. and why it's important. We were saying actually the difficult thing is deciding what research to trust. So yes. there's kind of an information overload and yeah. how do you know when something is effectively a marketing yes. piece versus actually yeah. proper research that I can then yeah. leverage in my work. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I find that such a difficult kind of swamp to yes. navigate. Yeah, and hopefully the rest of the session will help us kind of wade through that and sail on into the sunset <laughs> as a result. So thank you so much for raising that. Um, anyone else has got a kind of perspective on how you use research and what you want to use it for? I suppose it's about just making your toolkit bigger. And I was just talking about research being quite a disassociated way to open up conversations. Yeah. Um, rather than um, sometimes people can get quite defensive if you question them directly about beliefs that they may have about certain things. And I think especially people that are more reflective, giving a few articles beforehand mm -hmm. about a said topic can then really enrich that conversation and open them up to much more um, open-minded dialogue. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So research as a, a conversation starter. I always used to say when I was running a research program, for, I did it for 15 years, that actually it's much easier to open a conversation when you have a piece of data. Not that you're using the data to prove that your point is right, but say the data says it's like a third party in the room and we can open up a different level of conversation without me having to defend my position or the person I'm speaking to defend theirs because we say, well, what do we both think? of this evidence that has been surfaced. So, you know, it's really important. We're all using it for different reasons. And what I want to say in terms of is it a superfood or a killer carb, I don't mind how you use it. Just be intentionally aware of what you're using it for. If you see a stat you think, yes, that's great, but be aware that not everyone's going to be thinking, yeah, this is the best stat in the world. So. Yeah, it's really important. And to your point about how do we make sense of what's going on? You know, what is a sensible diet of research, given the fact that we've got so many options? That buffet of options is so big. Um, going to Harvard Business Review or some people who are actually reviewing, you know, are good at distilling the evidence is one way of making sense of it. Um, but we also, we're going to be, we're very much... Um, encouraged, particularly by the CIPD, I do a lot of work with the CIPD, that actually for us to be professionals and to have credibility and to have a voice in the way our organizations can flourish, we do need to be evidence informed. So how we use evidence is important. So a sensible choice for you, I think, depends on you know, three things. One, what are we trying to do? Let's be really clear here about what we're trying to do. Open a conversation, prove a point, disprove a point, 
be aware of risks, reduce risks, you know, ch challenge ourselves, stretch ourselves. We're stuck in a corner, we've got conflict. Let's be clear about the goals that we want to address through this. Then, and something that I've kind of really been thinking about since I stepped away from my 15-year project of Benchmark, is, you know, what is your personal perspective? And I'd written these slides before Bo started talking to us this morning, you know, about where we're coming, who we are dictates the meaning that we put onto the research that we read. And being very intentional about understanding our own perspectives, our own biases is super important. And I cannot, I've been coming here for 23 years, the two keynotes this year, I personally believe have been the most fundamentally challenging and important keynotes for us as learning professionals. Because what they both address is what we bring to our profession. Not our environment, not our studies, not our tools, our technologies, our methods, our methodologies, our approaches, our working out. It's who we are, and knowing who we are makes a difference. So perspective is super, super important. And our perspective on research, how we read meaning into research is important as well. And third is what results do we want? <laughs> you know, practically, we've got to make a case, we've got to make a business case. We want to change people's ideas inside the organization. We need to look at results. So really, I just wanted to share with you a few, a few things. We've looked at what do we want from our research diet. We've looked at and explored what we need, proof, evidence, ideas, simplicity, <laughs> confidence about making this first step moving forward. Um, and then really, what I'm thinking about in terms of perspective, I want to share with you my perspective, because actually every single researcher, and it's not just the suppliers that are biased, it's the scientists that are biased. It's the, you know, kind of like the, the explorers. We've all got an angle that we're looking for that has been based on our past experience and the things that we're interested in. So I want to share with you what my bias was in the research studies that I was involved with. Because I was interested in education technology and I knew that people basically ignored it unless you could prove it did something different that went beyond what learning traditionally, or training traditionally also did, I was always interested in impact. I was always interested in how learning and development can make a difference to the businesses we work in, and that wasn't constrained by the way we did things in the past. So 20 years ago, I knew that was important to me. Um, and it was a bias that I put into my, I was looking for it. I can tell you right now, I was looking for that in every study that I did. I was looking to that point about how can we be seen? How can we have the argument? How can we actually talk sense to people who say, well, that won't work for me, and managers won't like that, and individuals won't like that? It's like, how do we use evidence to try and open a new conversation? That was a bias that I brought to my own research. Um, I was also super interested in not what we could talk about, but what we could do. So in the studies that I generated and created, um, I had loads of things, you know, we wanted to see whether 70, 10, 2010 would work. So I spoke to Charles Jennings and said, you know, if someone was doing this, what behaviours would you expect them to be taking action on? And it was those behaviours that we put into the study, not the are you doing 70, 2010 or not, because that was in, interpreted differently. And for me, I've always had this bias of what do we need to do to stay relevant as a profession? What do we need to be able to let go of? Um, now, they are biases. They are biases. Independence was super important to me. My research was sponsored by multiple organizations because I didn't want any one person saying, well, you would say that because you've, you supported the research. Um, so every piece of study that you see will have a bias. The McKinsey's, you know, the Harvard Business Reviews, they will all have a background, and just being aware of that is super important when we start to look at this. Even if we find someone who really resonates with us, who's saying something different, something opposite? Let's stretch our brains with the research that we have. And I think this is really important because you're, what you're looking for will also determine what you see in the studies that come by you. 
So our kind of goals and our biases and our perspectives influence the questions that we ask, influence what we read into what we see. So when you get a whole range of research resources like the, the, like the ones I've just shared with you, just be aware about what you're looking for. And it's okay to have bias. It's okay to say, actually, my past has shown me this. So it, we just need to say what, you know, what's good for us and what's good to stretch us and what's good to challenge us as well. So that's just something on perspective. Uh, you know, here's a stat. It's from Accenture's work as the CHRO, and basically they found that organizations who were prioritizing technology and data and people, bringing people into that process as well and thinking about how we connect and engage with people. Organizations were prioritizing those three at a strategic level were actually reporting 11% improvement in productivity versus 4% uh, of those who were only prioritizing their data and their technology. So us as people professionals, that's kind of quite cool. You know, that's quite an interesting thing to say, actually, this statistic says that you know, we potentially have got a role in achieving those goals. So this, one, this study is actually in the pack that I wanted to share with you in case it's useful for you. But it also went on to say, what are the skills that those high, res, they call them high res chief HR officers have that the rest of them don't? Those who are really being able to operate in the organization to support technology, data, and people, bring them all together, achieving business goals. And they had a whole range of skills there system thinking, talent development, business acumen, financial acumen, technology, data, the circle around the outside are the data of the high res people and the inside are the people in the study who weren't achieving the high res productivity goals. So again, kind of useful. It's a kind of, and for us, we can think, well, we're, there, we're not HR, we're not chief HR professionals at all in any shape or form. But then when we look at that in context of a study that, this is a continuation of the study that I started um, with Mindtools, the performance benchmark, <coughs> they looked at the skills that we as HR professionals believe we need, or have at the moment in blue, and believe we need in red. And again, you can say, well, that's a long list. I'm too overwhelmed to be able to deal with that. But when we start to kind of look at the differences and say, actually, where can these prioritize? Are these giving us an insight about the kinds of skills that we actually need? When, and we also found that in the uh, benchmark, the MyTools benchmark, that actually high-performing teams did have, in learning and development, across all levels, did have more of these types of skills. So there's a kind of, there's two sources that are saying, as people professionals, maybe we need to boost our own skills in order to retain, become more agile and more adaptive. So again, these studies are, are, are all in the pack, but it's how we combine them about achieving the goals that we need. And if we want to be ready and prepared for the future, you know, these, you know, we could look at this as trend data to say, actually, what do we need as a team to be ready for the future? But we could also be using it to have a different conversation within the business. Does that, is that kind of help, you know, in terms, like how do we mix and match the data? How do we test it again? How do we triangulate is the uh, kind of official, official process of that. And, but for me, that's, I, I, I get a warm feeling when several sources say, actually, we really do need to be prioritizing it. And as learning professionals, the data does say that the second priority for us, barrier for us, is that we just feel overwhelmed under pressure and overwhelmed. But this is where research can actually, where can we be smarter? How can we, where do we need to prioritize our work? The second area I want to talk about is perspective. So we talk about um, superfood or killer carbs. So if I said to you, you know, this research reminds me of an avocado, what, is, that, is that good or is that bad? What, what do you think? Hands up for good. Superfoods, a piece, a piece of avocado research has got to be you. Hands up for bad. For me, bad every time. Hate avocado. As soon as I see it on the menu, I mean, I only hate it because actually, to be honest, I really don't mind it. I'm not allergic. It's not going to kill me. But I really just, just don't like it. And I get really irritated that everyone else does and thinks it's such a marvelous thing. So if I see it on a menu, 
I'm like, I just don't, <laughs> I'm not interested. Out of principle, I'm not going to touch that. You know, someone gave it to me that I wanted to impress. Obviously, I'd eat it. But avocado for me doesn't represent what it represents to a lot of people, something good and healthy. So again, understanding our own perspectives and our own biases is super important with that. And that kind of, I think this is really important for us, is that what is good for you in your arguments it might not be good for the people that you're talking to. So kind of understanding the context in which you're using research and applying research and understanding your own bias. As I say, I know I'm not allergic to it and I'm very aware that I just say it because just that everyone needs to have one food they don't like. You know, so I've got, I've got no reason. And I would also say to you, is there any research you look at and you say, oh, and actually you've got no reason not to like it. So I think, I think this, this perspective is really super important here. And I just want to show you some statistics as we kind of pull, pull together on this that we can respond to either in a positive way or a negative way. Um, if anyone isn't aware, the World Economic Forum released their new jobs, um, a future of jobs research on Monday. It is a brilliant read. That's my positive superfood. <laughs> you might not think that it's a brilliant read, but it, it really starts to look at all of the different ways that we need to be thinking about change in the organization. If you've not seen this, take a look at it. Because it was saying that 44% you know, of our core skills across the business in terms of future trend um, is really gonna change in the next five years. And that's up from the prediction um, uh, 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 probably about, was it seven years ago? Then we combine that with this LinkedIn report. We had data from the LinkedIn report. They said 25% of skill sets for jobs had changed in the last five years. This is not just a prediction, but it has changed in the last five years. So even if people don't believe the top statistic, then if you combine it with another statistic, you're starting to build up an argument to say, okay, well, what is our role as learning professionals in that space. And then the Pew Research says 62% um, of American people say that AI, which often AI has been taken as, as a, a, the reason for all of this change recently, will have a major impact on our work. But only 20%, 28% believe that it'll impact them personally. So when you look at all of these three data sets together, this represents complexity for us. It actually represents quite a complex environment, but it also represents like such an incredible opportunity for us as learning professionals as well. Because it's all about change, it's all about how do we change, how does the audience that we're working with change, why is it gonna be necessary, who needs to come on board? This kind of data for me, it's really rich for kind of really starting to go back into work and saying, perhaps we need to do things differently. But also, these are the barriers that we're gonna be up against. And we're, they're also the barriers that impact us as well. Data can often be quite an uncomfortable mirror to look in, which is why we tend to squint. And we tend to take, for me, I take my glasses off so it's all blurry. I don't quite see what's there, so I think it looks pretty good. But this thing about the fact that it's gonna change the world, but it's not gonna change me, that one's a scary one for us as learning professionals. So, is your research good for you? Um, the question that I have with that is that, for me, the reason I popped this one up there, that looks like a treat, but actually the only time I ever eat avocado is when someone does something fancy with it and sticks it in a chocolate mousse. You know, and so if something is good, some research is going to be effective, and you need to kind of really engage somebody. You need to do it from their perspective. You need to understand where they're coming from in order to use research to have a fruitful, healthy conversation. Um, just a couple of other quick research findings um, because we are closed off now. Um, LinkedIn Learning um, said that it's really important for us to map learning to business priorities. And it was our first, you know, we need to be doing that. So if you look at anything today, you know, work out how you can connect better with business rather than get business connect better with you. Sure, that's fine. But actually, the research study that I was doing um, which continues even now, 
says actually only 42% of us analyze the problem before recommending a solution. We don't get under the skin of what's going on in business. And this is quite scary because this statistic has never really gone above 45% in the 20 years that we've known that it correlates back to business goals. For 20 years, the research has been showing us that this makes a difference, particularly when we're overwhelmed. And 30% only of, of us actually look at uh, the actions that we need to take. So these are just small little snippets of research, but they can challenge us. We can ignore it. We can blame everything around us as to why this doesn't work. But evidence-informed decisions are absolutely critical for all of us. We can't afford to ignore the stuff that's been around a long, long time and it's been triangulated by multiple sources if we want to be smart, effective, powerful learning professionals. And then really the third thing is about results. Um, and all I'd like to share with you really is that if we want to use research to really fuel our professional practice, we just need to look at it from different perspectives. And the research that I wanted to, sh you know, the link I've shared with you has got a really detailed link back to the CIPD's evidence-informed practice. Because actually, evidence-informed practice doesn't mean to say I use the LinkedIn study or the Mindtool study or the Harvard, you know, it's one source. It actually says that we need inputs across a wide range of different disciplines, different ideas, scientific studies, stuff that's been peer-reviewed, looking at organizational internal data like Anka, you're doing there, looking at the stakeholder insights and looking at what we bring to the party. And then having these questions that we ask around, you know, what are we trying to do? What kind of research is available to us in the time that we have available? How do we assess it? How do we argue it out internally with other people to understand how it should inform our practice? How do we aggregate that together and use it to apply and try something, experiment, do something, gather your own insights as a result of that and see where it goes, assess where it goes. So I'm hoping that this lunchtime session has given you some food for thought, get it? Um, and also to just say that, you know, I want you to be able to love what's available to you in the same way that I do. Having the conversations, having it expand your mind, being curious and connected and, and just interested in what others say. And it takes the risk away from those important decisions that we all need to make to stay relevant and strong and appropriate. So the resources that I've got for you it looks at the evidence-informed practice. It looks at longitudinal studies and benchmarks. You know, things like Don Taylor's great um, global sentiment survey. You know, that's a great... That really helps you think about what people are talking about. But you need to compare that with what people are actually doing and whether it works. L&D skills strategies, um, learning and um, skills and research on tools, techniques, technologies. There's some research in there with learners, with business leaders, getting that different perspective. There is research from the suppliers. Don't ignore that, but just be aware of where they're coming from. Yeah, because if like several suppliers from several different sources are all pointing in the same direction, there's, you know, there's quality in that, but don't just buy from that supplier because their research has said this is what's important. But it is important. Don't ignore that. And also people to follow who really get this and are connected and engaged. And Julian, I'm going to add you uh, onto that list um, as well and Stella. So thank you so much for spending your lunchtime with us. And apologies if all this food has made you think, oh, quick, get her off the stage. I need my dinner. <laughs> then please be, feel free to go. But if you have any questions for me, um, to stay connected, love to hear from you. And I'd love to know what you think I need to be putting on this list. Because, hey, I'm a researcher. I want to know. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for, for coming and giving your lunchtime up today.